our speakers today are Marie Jose Espinosa and from the Center for Democracy in the Americas and Teresa Garcia Castro. Um, our technical expert is Gretchen Sanchez Higueras, who's down in the lower left corner, et cetera. And uh, all problems. I'm getting muted again. Um, we have to be careful with that. Um, very briefly, Maria Jose Espinosa Carillo is the Director for Programs and Operations at the Center for Democracy in the Americas. Marie Jose provides strategic and operational leadership to support the growth of CDA's advocacy initiatives, Cuba travel program, and research efforts. <clears throat> Prior to joining CDA, she was an international affairs analyst at the Center for the Study of Asia and Oceania and a member of the research team that published reports on Cuba's economic, political, and social affairs regarding Asia and Oceania. She has two master's degrees, a master's in science and economics from the University of Havana and a master's of science in tur tourism from the University of the Belarus, as well as a uh, another a Bachelor's of Science in Economics from the University of Havana. Teresa Garcia Castro is a Senior Program Associate at the Washington Office of Latin America, and she provides research and support for the Drug Policy and the Andes Projects, as well as the Cuba programs. She also focuses on the intersection of women and incarceration for drug-related offenses Prior to joining WOLA, Teresa was a research assistant at American University, where she co-authored several articles on U.S.-Cuban relations. In addition, she has a, a degree from the Instituto Superior de Relaciones Internacionales in Havana, and she has a master's in international relations from the School of International Studies at American University, where she was awarded the SIS Award for Outstanding Academic Performance. They will provide clarification on a number of issues relating to civil society. And after that, we will have question and answers. You can put your questions into the chat room and we will extract them. Um, so we will begin. And amongst the things that they will address initially is the clarification of what constitutes civil society. Was it as traditionally been thought the organizations or the associations that only were non-state or in countries like Cuba and China, where you have an overlapping of networks, friendship, and work networks amongst others between people who are outside the state and people who are within the state. And that's one of the major issues that they will be dealing with today. The other thing is there's been historically a tendency to view civil society organizations as the good guys. Let me remind you that in the 1920s and 30s in Germany, as well as in Italy, the community organizations eventually served as basis for the rise of Hitler in Germany and Mussolini in Italy. In the United States in the 1940s and 50s, community organizations in the South were essential to the maintenance of Jim Crow laws as well as the promotion of white supremacy. So that's the type of complexity that Marie Jose and Teresa are going to discuss today in terms of Cuba. Marie Jose. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, thank you. I wanted to start uh, by thanking the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University, the Cuba program, and of course to Meg, first for the invitation and then for your support during the research process. 
I also want to thank everyone that's uh, joining us today. I see a lot of familiar names, so thank you for joining us. It is a great pleasure to be here tonight. Um, as Meg uh, mentioned, this is a very complicated issue, and I'm going to start with an introduction about uh, setting the ground for what we're presenting here today. Um, as you all know, a visitor to Cuba today would experience a far different country than when the country started uh, uh, the important process of socioeconomic reforms about 10 years ago. Now we see a country with a more open, vibrant, and bustling society. Over a year ago, Teresa and I started uh, this research project after observing what we consider new dynamics in the Cuban civil society including independent projects to expand access to public information, citizen legislative initiatives against gender-based violence, spontaneous marches defending LGBTQI rights, and also private citizen mobilization in response to natural disasters. And in general, we are seeing something different. We're seeing a more diverse society and also a society that is more unequal now than it was 30 years ago. We're seeing an uh, unprecedented increase in citizen participation looking to change government policies and not necessarily related to opposition movements. And in general, we're seeing more community-led initiatives. Spaces for dissent in Cuba still remain tightly controlled by the government. However, we have seen some instances in which the same government has responded with tolerance, with dialogue and reforms, and in others with distrust and repression. It is worth noting that the case studies that we are discussing here today are still modest in scope and magnitude, and that the study focuses on actions mainly taking place in Havana and in other urban areas, in most cases led by people with access to resources like internet. Although it is important to note that several other regions of Cuba are experiencing a resurgence of civil society and have also developed some promising um, initiatives. However, even if these might be considered incipient examples, given Cuba's recent history, we think this is an unprecedented growth of citizen participation and that is remarkable. And it's defined in a new relationship between Cuban citizens and their political leaders. So today, we want to go beyond the binary take that has historically defined Cuban civil society and discuss some early findings about these recent trends that we have observed. What are the driving factors and what are the new channels of organizations that we observe, as well as to discuss the government response to these changes. I'm pretty sure we will leave uh, many unanswered questions, and by no means this is a generalization of Cuban civil society. And Teresa will uh, explain more about this in a, in, in a little bit. I want to close now with a brief outline of the presentation. Um, first, we're going to have a conceptualization of Cuba civil society and how it might differ from the prevailing scientific and media narrative. Also, we will talk about uh, internal and external factors that have influenced this vibrancy of, of civil society in the last 10 years. What does it mean to have a more open and bustling society and what has been the reaction from the government? What are the consequences of current US administration policy toward Cuba for civil society groups? And some final reflections. Over to Teresa. Thank you, Maria, for, for setting the tone. And I would also like to extend my appreciation to the organizers of this webinar and to all of you for spending your Tuesday evening with us. It's great to see so many familiar faces, as Maria said, many Cuba experts and followers, and I hope this is more like a conversation than a one-way talk. Um, as Meg was saying, uh, it is important to try to establish a, a framework uh, for the conceptualization of Cuban civil society. And this is just our understanding. We are not going to be too theoretical, uh, but it is important to, to define what's, what's the framework for it. Um, and according to the prevailing narrative in the international media, the Cuban society is often perceived as an homogeneous entity, this isolated place from the rest of the world uh, where exercises of political freedoms are blocked and where the public sphere is very limited to the one dictated by the official media and the institutions. 
And in fact, this is a limited framework that does not correspond uh, to the way that civil society culture uh, has changed in Cuba, particularly after the 90s. And it is important to distinguish between the characterization of civil society groups corresponding to only a centralized um, Cuban government on the one hand and on the other one um, acting as a fist columns on behalf of the US government. And it is a real complex reality of civic activity that has been developing uh, within the islands. Some experts have called it this kind of middle ground gray space. Um, the truth is that civil society in Cuba is neither an exclusive space for the maintenance of the existing order or nor an exclusive space for political opposition and the promotion of re regime change. So as Meg was mentioning, uh, the civil society space is formed by these informal networks that are linked horizontally and at sometimes vertically to political elites and the state. So are people going in and out the civic space and only civil society, but also the political sphere? And then uh, very briefly on the historical development to put things a little bit on context, um, in the decade of the 60s in Cuba, the independent civil society groups were replaced by kind of vertical civil society, social civil society composed by mass organizations like the Federation of Cuban Women. And Cuban leaders regarded civil associations and as potential threats to the status quo and mostly prohibited all of them. And in the following years, Cuba evolved as a centralized system. Uh, and while it achieved some levels of social justice, centralism and paternalism had consequences in terms of societal debates and also the participation of people in the civic life. In the mid 80s, there were some professional associations that were created, but particularly after the fall of the Berlin World, uh, the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union and the socioeconomic crisis that trigger more space for debates and in Cuba and issues like civil participation, religious faith, race and equality, gender and sexual preferences and other, among other topics, became more prominent and subject to the public debate. And then intellectual and religious circles, uh, including some print journals and magazines like Espacio, like Cal, Vitral, Palabra Nueva, and the magazine Temas, uh, gained prominence and contributed to this public debate. Uh, in 2013, Cuba Posible, uh, this uh, laboratory of ideas, uh, organized public forums, uh, published online articles, and tried to facilitate this cooperative research among its growing network to try to simulate debates around civil society and other issues in Cuba. And as in previous process of these reforms, uh, the socioeconomic changes in the last um, more than a decade have created conditions that favor the fortification of civil society and also more civic engagement in Cuba. And now Maria is going to explore some of these factors. Thank you. So as Teresa mentioned, Cuban civil society has been changing throughout the years and, and these changes are, are the result of multiple factors. However, the, we will only discuss today the two main drivers of the evolution that we have observed in the last 10 years um, that have represented uh, a movement from the past. First, there is the, the process of domestic reforms in Cuba. Um, as many of you know, since Raul Castro became president and in response to the stagnating economic growth, increased corruption and growing underdevelopment, the government started a process, inevitable for some, of, of gradual socioeconomic and institutional reform that has led to several um, iterations and continues today. These changes, albeit slow and insufficient, aim at updating the country's economic model to stimulate growth and modernize the governance structure. The reforms entail um, um, and have entailed a lot of measures, among other changes, expanding the scope and size of the non-state sector, promoting foreign investment, updating laws and regulations that allow more economic freedoms, changing individual property laws, for example, allowing individuals to buy and, and sell their homes and car, and giving more power to local and regional governments, something that we are actually seeing more and more with the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. 
But from these reforms, we would like to emphasize one, which is the expansion of internet access. And this is because much of the expanded civil discourse is taking place in the digital public sphere. And while the government has maintained a monopoly on print and broadcast media, with only a few exceptions, there is more diversity in the digital public sphere. This means that access to information is coming more and more from social media, WhatsApp, Telegram, and other um, online platforms. But this started um, as part of the process of economic reforms in 2014 when the government installed the first public Wi-Fi wi hotspots ac across the island, and this was a big change for millions of Cubans. And then in November 2018, Etexa, who's the uh, Cuban state-owned telecommunications monopoly, started offering mobile internet access to the country's population. This was a service that it was previously restricted to journalists, to diplomats, to foreign firms, and, and other like small groups. Today, and according to available resources, there are currently an estimated 7.1 million internet users in Cuba and 7.7 .7 million active social media users. Still, internet use is very limited to those who can't afford to pay the, to pay the price, which depends on the data plan, but it remains very expensive for most Cubans. Telecommunication services, as I, as I mentioned, are exclusively offered by Texa and are controlled by the Cuban government. Nonetheless, the rapid growth of internet access has been a game changer um, for Cuba civil society. People can now reach a broader and diverse range of information. Younger generations find new professional opportunities, business development options through new applications that are often being developed by Cubans inside Cuba. And another growing phenomenon is the use of social media platforms as organizing mechanisms for citizen activism, and we will have some examples later. And this is via Twitter, Facebook, blog posts, Telegram, WhatsApp. Many humans now are empowered to express themselves and to establish a, a certain type of dialogue with, their, uh, with the government, with other Cubans, and also with the world. The second driving factor that we wanted to touch today is Cuba's new foreign policy approach. Um, and we think the most far-reaching change in foreign policy was the restoration of diplomatic relations with the United States and the start uh, of a process to normalize relations with the US. In the last two years of the Obama administration only, both governments signed 23 bilateral agreements on areas of mutual interest. But how does this impact civil society? Well, um, the rapprochement had significant impact on the iPhone life, culture, and economy. The most um, important development for the Cuban people and for the non-state sector was the opening of new legal travel avenues for the United States. And I wanna give you only one example. In 2018, nearly 638,000 United States citizens traveled to Cuba compared to only 92,000 in 2014. This factor combined with the restoration of direct commercial air travel between both countries and other financial and commercial agreements that were implemented boosted the growth of Cuba's entrepreneurial sector scope and creativity and impacted, positively impacted small private businesses, especially those involved in economic activities related to tourism and of course their supply chain. After more than 60 years of limited engagement between the two countries, Cubans were now exposed to a steady flux of Americans with whom they had historically shared connections and of Cuban Americans, travelers, many of whom traveled to the country for the first time to meet with their families and their friends on the island. There were more cultural and academic exchanges, American brands, Hollywood films, and major events started making their way into Havana. And this brought opportunities for all and new businesses to flourish and upgrade their practices. This new context accelerated the transformation of Cuba's social sphere while the island's private sector gained more space more independence and contributing to bolstering the country's outspoken civil society. But what does it mean to have a more open civil society, a more vibrant civil society? And what has been the reaction for, from the Cuban government? Teresa will tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so how, like Maria was saying, these factors have pushed um, and civil society 
courses of actions to hold the state accountable, but also to try to change some of the government practices and policies. Um, they're finding new bottom-up channels of communications to express, express critical views uh, and also to articulate their demands. Uh, most of this conversation is having is taking place in social media platforms, but also in physical places through more traditional regular meetings. Um, and these dynamics and the presence of new civil society actors have influenced to some degree the new policies by the states. And in some cases, um, and we will talk a little bit more about these responses. However, in some other cases, the government has responded with repression and censorship particularly around the rights of freedom of expression, association and manifestations. And although these rights are recognized at the constitutional level, um, the constitution that was recently approved, there are not law or regulations to guarantee those rights. And some, in some occasions, there have been arbitrary detentions of journalists, activists and artists intended to discourage expression of critical views against the government. Similarly, the lack of an association law that regulates civil society organizations and how they work, and the lack of uh, recognition, legal recognition of these independent actors makes them vulnerable to censorship, harassment, and their criminalization. However, we will see in four uh, case studies how uh, civil society has been active uh, and also how they have changed kind of like the government response. And the first case that I would like to briefly explore, it's uh, the Cuban constitution, uh, the process of the referendum and the drafting of the new constitution because it generated some unusual public debate in Cuba. And this process was, uh, kind of uh, pretty pretty Im Im important and relevant in terms of citizen participation uh, because of the levels of feedback the government received and the level of debate within uh, some of these meetings and discussions around the different issues around the constitution. And according to official numbers, more than 5 million people participated in the debates uh, in workplace, schools, community centers, and where participants suggested a large number of modifications. One of the best uh, well-known examples of uh, this kind of debate was reversing the language in a provision that would have legalized the same-sex marriage. And this attracted significant pushback from the evangelical churches and some tech sectors in Cuba and within the Catholic Church, which uh, organized a campaign to withdraw the provision and then the government postponed its debate uh, for the family code. Uh, and then for the first time in this time of consultation, Cuban independent digital media outlets like El Toque called for citizen oversight of the referendum, which was unprecedented in Cuba. And using social media platforms, they were able to collect data on electoral polls as opposed to the traditional way of monitoring uh, of elections done by representatives of the Cuban political and mass organizations. At the same time, there were debates um, Again, in social media platform, but also the physical debates about all kinds of different issues around, around the Cuba. So it generated a lot of discussion and interest engagement. The second example are like new spaces and channels of communications that Cuban entrepreneurs are creating to challenge some of the government regulations and advocate for the expansion of the private sector in Cuba. Uh, and non-state sector uh, has been one of the main actors in organizing and challenging some of the regulations uh, because they affect their businesses, but also they affect their lives. And in the last few years, they have been advocating for more flexible regulations, including the tax policy, opportunities for commercial imports, legal recognition of small and medium private enterprises, among others. And for instance, in 2017, a group of 43 entrepreneurs started a dialogue initiative with the Ministry of Labor and Social Justice, um, and Social Security, sorry, which regulates the private initiative in Cuba to push for their demands. And this initiative, which was first of its kind, uh, was successful in that it established a communication channel with the, with the ministry and with the Minister of uh, Social Security and since then, they have send, been sending letters, they have had several meetings, and in several occasions, the government has rolled back some of the regulations, seeding feedback from these entrepreneurs and from Cuban economics as well. In, 19, um, in 2019, last year, 
uh, another example is that the private consulting firm AUGE uh, in Cuba founded an initiative called the board, La Junta, uh, and this was a space for Cuban entrepreneurs to come together and discuss opportunities and challenges for the private sector. So they were also articulating their own channels of communications and organizing among themselves. And at the beginning of this year, a group of them uh, published a list of 20 recommendations suggesting very concrete policies to, um, that the Cuban government could take to try to strengthen the self-employment and the private sector in Cuba. The other thing that I would like to mention is uh, a legislative initiative around women's rights. Um, and it was uh, in November of 2019, a group of 40 women, uh, Cuban women, submitted a request to the National Assembly, the Cuban Parliament, to push for a comprehensive law against gender-based violence. Um, and this is unprecedented because of its it is a legislative initiative, but also because uh, gender issues in Cuba were mostly regulated and debated within the framework of the Federation of Women. Um, and despite the fact that the comprehensive law was not included in the legislative schedule, the Cuban government responded to this appeal. And a few weeks after the group of women presented the proposal to the National Assembly and made this public, uh, the National Center for Sex Education in Havana, Senate Sex, announced the revision of more than 50 laws and degree laws uh, and, uh, and, and other norms to try to regulate and norm against women and uh, gender-based violence against women and girls. And in, this, in, in addition to this, uh, the government invited four members of this group uh, with a meeting to different committees of the National Assembly, which was also uh, a, good, a good, good feedback and another way of communicating with the government. And the last example that I would like to mention, uh, there are initiatives to increase information access. Um, and as we know, there is a proliferation of independent uh, thought and journalism and spaces of reflection, particularly through social media. But there are specific uh, projects that are interesting because they're trying to spread independent information, open data and transparency, which is one of the weak spots, I think, uh, from the Cuban government because there is not a lot of official data um, besides the ONA. Uh, and these two really tech examples are the Post Data Club and the Project Inventario, the Inventory. Uh, and they're trying to explore different issues generally not covered by the official media, including migration and gender approaches to entrepreneurship. And they combine research journalists with civic technology to create resources so that people can improve transparency, can engage in these political processes, but also uh, try to establish new mechanisms of accountability. Um, and now I will pass it to Maria for some other examples of activism. Thanks. So um, there are other examples that are more related to what we call activism and civil, civic engagement, especially as the Cuban public has become more diverse and income disparities have expanded with the growth of the private sector. Um, and because of other reasons, the views and interests of different groups have diverged. The expansion of the public sphere through the growth of internet access, social media and digital journalism has favored an increase in citizen mobilization and campaigns around very specific issues. We, um, we, we saw, for example, a spontaneous response to the, to the consequences of the tornadoes that came not only from the private sector, and that was last year, but also from several communities who created several support groups inside and outside Cuba we also saw in April 2019 how people came together in an unprecedented march in Havana demanding the end of animal abuse and the approval of a law on the subject in what some organizers believe was the first independent march um, authorized in Cuba by the government. We also saw what the, uh, the organizer, organizers called the Trash Challenge, which was an initiative to clean several areas of Havana and civil society groups convened in uh, this simple but uncommon initiative in Cuba only through social media and had the support of small private businesses. Finally, we wanted to mention uh, the first independent march around LGBTQI rights. Um, as we know, following the postponement of the approval of same-sex marriage during the constitutional referendum, 
the National Center for Sexual Education, CENESEX in Cuba, canceled the, the celebration of the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia that takes place every year. And it was reportedly due to external factors that weren't uh, explained uh, in detail. Cuba civil society, including LGBTQI activists, university students, members of the artistic community, entrepreneurs, anti-government activists, and many others, responded by organizing their own parade in Havana. The march provoked some cases of harassment forms and forms of repression, including the arrests of several activists before, during, and after uh, the events. But this march was spontaneously and horizontally organized via social media. The, the parade demonstrated that there is a growing number of an increasingly diverse set of actors in the LGBTQI uh, community, and not, and not only in this community, um, and, and not only around this issue, but around and other issues, there is a diverse group of actors that are demanding and are uh, organizing campaigns. Another expression of diverse civil society of a diverse civil society in Cuba are examples of social responsibility and community-led initiatives that Teresa will present. Yeah, so we yeah, we have also been monitoring uh this um kind of social responsibility initiatives. Uh some of them uh and most of them are uh the community level. Um and the fact is that as Cuba uh, increasingly moves towards a more more mixed economy, the state also has been losing its traditional role as the only provider of services for the Cuban people. And at the same time, Cuban entrepreneurs, activists, artists have also promoted these community initiatives based on social responsibility. And this is also part of an attempt to transform the surroundings. Uh, and they have developed sustainable projects taking into account uh, environmental protections, social impact in their communities, but also the specific needs of some vulnerable groups. Um, and in some occasions, they have done this with an entrepreneurial solidarity spirit. So they have partnered with other private businesses, with other community initiatives, um, but they are also building a partnership with state institutions and sometimes with international organizations. Uh, one of the most famous examples, I would say, of this one of these projects is the project Arte Corte in Old Havana. Um, and they have all kind of initiatives, including programs for the elderly, uh, for the children, for pets, and try to promote the solidarity economy, uh, generate revenues, generate employment, but at the same time, provide free programs for the community and try to invest at the community level. Another interesting example is the Habisi project um, that has responded to a specific uh, problem of insufficient public transportation in Havana, but also to, uh, to fight pollution. This initiative it's, uh, provides a system of public bicycles in Havana. And they started with the pilot project um, and it was a novel initiative in the country. Um, they uh, started as with some members of the private businesses, Belo Cuba, and then they collaborated with local government, also with All Havana, uh, which is very specific in, in its nature, uh, as, as some of you know. Um, but it's a good example of this public-private alliance and how to promote an alternative way of transportation in tune with the preservation of the environment in the improvement of public health and also the enjoyment of the Havana heritage. Um, there are other pro projects that we can mention more tailored to underprivileged communities like Project Agocan in the community of Los Positos uh, and they provide um, free food and meal to the elderly community uh, which is also an impacted community and it's a it's a it's a trend increasing trend in Cuban society, uh, the elderly population. So some of these um, some of these projects have been trying to address some of these social issues, as well as issues of gender, race, and increasing inequalities. Um, and like in every country in the world um, right now, Cuba oh, for the last few months, Cuba has been combating the spread of COVID-19, uh, and this uh, difficult time has also triggered uh, new civil society. Society responses. Um, Maria, over to you. Thanks. 
Um, as Teresa mentioned, uh, COVID-19, it's impacting Cuba and it's impacting civil society. We bring a few examples. For some context, uh, I would like to say that from, from an epidemiological perspective, the virus has touched much fewer people in Cuba than in other parts of Latin America and the world. But the, the pandemic reaches Cuba at a time when the country is already facing an economic crisis with shortages of fuel, food, medicines, and hygienic products with the perspective of, of currency unification and dollarization. And now with the hub of uh, foreign tourism and commercial, commercial passenger flights, the Cuban economy will face what some uh, experts are predicting to be a crisis with no parallels and, and a more uh, precarious crisis than the one uh, experienced in the 1990s following the fall of the Soviet Union. Cuba's capacity to respond to the pandemic is also hampered by U.S. sanctions and the U.S. embargo is deterring international humanitarian efforts to the island. In general, Cuba's measures address the social effects of the crisis and seek to protect vulnerable groups, but at the same time, pre-existing gender and other socioeconomic inequalities are posing challenges and will honestly define the ways in which women and other vulnerable groups will enter remain and leave uh, this crisis. So how things are changing in terms of civil society participation during the pandemic and how the interactions with the government have been? Yes, so um, as in other as in other countries, as Maria was saying, the global pandemic has severely impacted uh, people's life, but also the business uh, and Cuba is not the exception. And the Cuban entrepreneurs have faced the operation reductions, unemployment, closures, and even bankruptcy. However, in the midst of these challenges, we have seen more private projects and independent initiatives to try to help their communities at a very needed time, uh, showing their solidarity and creativity. And some of the examples are the continuation of the other initiatives that I was mentioning before. Uh, in particular, uh, this initiative have mostly focused on supplying products and services uh, in high demand mm -hmm. in a public health crisis, including hygiene products, food, uh, protection for healthcare personnel, frontline workers and vulnerable communities. Um, just to mention a few examples, restaurants like Bella Chao have donated and distributed food to the elderly community in the Buena Vista neighborhood in Havana. A creative group of graphic designers uh, named Elfos, um, they have created PVC face shields for Cuban medical personnel. And they also have collaborated with other entrepreneurs by posting their efforts in social media. A group of Cuban mechanics, uh, like car mechanics and car repairs, uh, have been repairing Cuban ambulances and supporting the Cuban government with this kind of initiatives. Um, others, like the fashion brand Dador, are creating face masks and donating them to those in need in, in their communities, but also to medical personnel. And this is just to name a few examples. Um, and again, it's a little bit it's to illustrate and describe a little bit this process, but at the same time, it makes us think about the role that these communities and these actors have in the civil society and also in the future of the country. We are no, we also know that some of the private entrepreneurs who have been organizing and coming together have been pushing for some of these recent uh, economic reforms that have been announced. Um, the Red of Entrepreneurship uh, at the University of Havana uh, is a very interesting space uh, because they gather academics and entrepreneurs, but it's a channel of communication with the Cuban government and, and they have a very important line of communication when they have had some of this feedback and they have recognized the role of this uh, part of the private sector and these entrepreneurs um, and, and, and their role in, in the future of the country, which we think it's very relevant. And on the other hand, it's also important to mention that as it has been the case in Latin American countries, COVID responses have served as a pretext to limit some rights and silent independent journalists, including, as I was mentioning, arbitrary detentions and increasing house arrest and the imposition of fines and other penalties using the Decree 370, which regulates the use of the internet in the island. So uh, as usual, it's, uh, it's a mixed bag. Um, 
in a very complicated, uh, a complicated environment that the Cuban government is regulating, but also that actors in the civil society is regulating. Um, and now Maria is going to explore a little bit uh, on how the Trump administration measures and recent sanctions have affected civil society groups in Cuba. Thanks. And I already see a question in the chat about this, so hopefully I will respond part of the question. So Cuba civil society groups had, had, have also suffered the consequences of the Trump administration policy toward Cuba. If Obama-era policies of engagement with Cuba positively influenced the development and growth of a diverse civil society through trade, travel, exchanges, the policy of hostility from the current U.S. administration has only reinforced the siege mentality in hardline sectors in Cuba, which encourages censorship and repression, as Teresa was mentioning too. What's more, the reduction of trade and travel has affected almost every aspect of Cuba society, cutting family ties, people to people, exchanges, academic and cultural exchanges, business to business support. Recent US sanctions only discourage the process of reforms because they affect the island's growing non-state sector and the capacity of many civil society groups to uh, be active. Instead, we need to see a more constructive approach that uh, not only stimulates um, internal reform, but that will also be to fully normalize relations between Cuba and the U.S. We think that constructive U.S.-Cuba relations have demonstrated to have a beneficial and lasting impact on both U.S. Q US and Cuban societies, especially during complicated periods in U.S.-Cuba relations. And continuing facilitating engagement between non-governmental actors is now more important th than ever. And I will, again, point out to two main things. Fair, First, people-to-people -people ties are essential and business-to-business -business engagement is an effective mechanism of support for the Cuban people. Finally, um, in, an, in an era when U.S. advocates are gearing up to refight battles that they thought long won in their countries, so, such as issues of gender equality policies and practices, race disparities, immigrant rights, LGBTQ rights, among others. And when on the Cuban side, there is an unprecedented increase in citizen participation and also civil society engagement, there is no doubt that the people of Cuba and the US can support and learn best practices from one another. Teresa. Sure. Um, so just to just to kind of conclude um, before we start the Q and A sessions, um, we would like to think and maybe speculate a little bit about uh, towards the fusion and and some kind of concluding remark or maybe food for thought. Um, and the first is that the study of the civil society in Cuba has historically presented several challenges as the state continues to maintain considerable political hegemony in the face of a changing public sphere. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been taboo for, for, for many years. Uh, and I think um, that these openings uh, and changes is also, it also stimulates us to think more about the, the study of the civil society. At the same time, it's, uh, it's a learning process for those actors. Um, and I would say, I can argue at the least from what we have seen, this, there's not a lot of um, culture for civic engagement and activism um, and mechanisms to structure and organize civil society in more relevant ways. Um, however, in the last decade, decade in particular, uh, civil society has grown to be more heterogeneous and more complex. And it has begun to transform the relationship with the state. And the relevant part is not only that the civil society and Cuban society is transforming, but also how the state is reacting and establishing this new relationship between the Cuban state and their citizens. Um, as we said, these initiatives are still modest in scope and outreach. Uh, however, it has become um, a trend uh, in terms of citizen mobilization and participation. And, and although the state continues to control most of the public spaces, uh, these new interactions have created new challenges and produced a mix of responses for the official institutions, sometimes uh, towards finding more constructive solutions, working together and in partnership, and others with a lot of skepticism and distrust uh, where the US 
component and the policy, the US policy towards Cuba also plays an important role, as Maria was telling us. And right now, the country is just going through a very challenging period as uh, every other country in the world. Um, and one hand, we have the increased sanctions and policy of hostilities from the current U.S. administration, which has reinforced the siege mentality and hardliner sectors in Cuba uh, and encourages censorship and repression. And on the other hand, the Cuban government uh, is facing so many challenges, including the economic crisis, uh, the COVID pandemic and the responses, the huge scarcities and food insecurity, austerity measures, a continuous process of migration, aging populations, among so many others. Um, so we do believe that Cuba is at a crossroads right now uh, and a very critical moment. Um, and I think that starting talking about it, uh, but also following these examples of the role of the money, the, the civil society, uh, and the role of uh, how it's changing this Cuban society in general, and the relation with its leader, it's much more important, uh, probably more important than ever. And I will leave it there. Uh, I know we already have some other questions, but we will also appreciate your feedback and comments. Okay, I got it. Did you unmute me? Okay, thank you very much, Marie, Jose, and Teresa. That was an exceptionally well-organized and thoughtful and perceptive uh, account. We do have a number of questions and um, they're quite meaty themselves. And one of the first is a basic uh, question um, and that is, um, what data is there about the actual prevalence of civil society organizations historically and more recently within Cuba? I, I can take that one. Uh, and um, how the process works. Um, and, and again, uh, it needs to change because there will be a new law. I mean, we hope that there will be a new law of association and to regulate the uh, associations and the creation of civil society groups. But as it is right now, the Ministry of Justice, uh, through the Registry of Association, it's the institution which regulates the creation of these new associations. Um, as far as we know, uh, there is no official data on the number uh, or a list of associations, at least not at the public registry, uh, which is, is one of the points that we're trying to make, the lack of official data on some of these issues. Um, so, so what, so yeah, we don't have numbers. Uh, that's the that's the short response. Uh, but also how it works right now, it's uh, like the associations have to be related to a specific issue, and it has to have like an umbrella uh, framework for it. So it has to have any any ministry in Cuba has to be its point of contact. And for instance, if there is an association for pets, there can only be one group or one association related to pets. The same with women, the same with several issues. And that, of course, is very restrictive. It doesn't recognize the plurality of actors, interests, and diversity of uh, the Cuban civil society. So um, that's something to take into consideration once they, uh, they have the, 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 new, the new law of association. I don't know if you would like to add something on that, Maria. Just to, just to add that um, there's probably data on the legally recognized um, associations, um, especially those that are, and those are the ones organized by the government, like uh, the Federation of Cuban Women and others. There is probably information on their websites. I have, we have, we didn't, uh, our research wasn't focused on, on, the, on that part of, of civil society, but there might be some information there. I don't know if uh, Meg that have been working on these issues for years uh, has some insights. Um, with respect to uh, the question mentioned historical uh, legacies in terms of uh, associationalism within Cuba, uh, Alfonso Queros, a historian, Peruvian historian, 
uh, has actually studied the level of civil society organization in Cuba in the 19th and early 20th century. So if you track down his work, you will find some hard data in terms of um, Cuba. Let me just say that Cuba had one, according to Alfonso, Cuba had one of the highest levels of associationalism in all of Latin America uh, in the 19th century, as well as in the early 20th century. So there's a strong tradition of community organization, civil society, activism, et cetera, in the country. Um, let's move on to some other questions. There are two questions here. Um, one from Catel, how is US policy toward Cuba helping or preventing the expansion of civil society on the island? And related to that, there's another question, how uh, is um, the uh, Cuban state uh, preventing the expansion of civil society on the island? So there are two questions that are related there. In terms, I can, I, yeah, I can take, um, so in terms of, of uh, US policy and how it influenced civil society, I think, um, as we mentioned in the presentation, one of the factors that we identify as uh, vital to the development of, of some of this initiative was, was um, the increased trade and travel to the island. The, the, the increased communication between uh, academia and cultural groups, um, the, the, the increased visits and people to people exchanges, again, again, creating opportunities for some to expand their businesses, to, to, to have some ideas and also to, to feel more, more empowered through, through, that, through that channel. And now, as I mentioned, we're seeing a Trump administration that has uh, closed all the Tra trade and, and travel avenues and 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 that's ha that has impacted the siege mentality of, of the Cuban government and the repression but also has impacted again private businesses and and other civil society groups that were benefiting from exchanges from conversation from from delegations visiting the island from even civil, civil society activists that were coming to the U.S. for for trainings, and there are, there are many, many ways in which US policies are, are affecting in a positive or a negative way. Uh, the development of Cuban civil society not being the only factor uh, influencing Cuban civil society. Teresa, would you like to add anything? Nope, I think she covered it. <laughs> okay. Um, Ryan Williams Hicks is asking if the internet is expensive and only accessible to those who can afford it. Does the use of the internet or social media to organize civil society demonstrations, events, have the effect of excluding those who cannot afford to get online? Uh, yeah, yes, the short answer is yes. I think uh, you're raising a great question uh, and it's uh, the, the access to, to, to having the platforms uh, who can afford uh, to have internet and therefore to engage in this kind of debate, which is taking online, taking place online, but also who can afford to have a private business in Cuba and have the resources to invest in the community and try to develop these projects. Um, so I, I do believe that it does, uh, it, it, it does reduce the amount of people and, 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 and not the only the amount of people who can afford these, it's our people who can, um, who, who have the resources to do it. Um, I also believe that there are some other more, more uh, kind of different ways of organizing, not necessarily online, that are taken in the community, at the community level, that sometimes they don't get enough visibility because uh, they are not published on the internet. So there's a way for us to gather that data or those examples or people are not monitoring that. Um, and those are happening at the very community level through more conventional or traditional spaces for mobilization and association um, through some communitarian projects, uh, some of them in partnership with the government. And they're trying to address different, different issues um, 
for instance, uh, we, in our research, we have examples uh, from the center of Ca Oscar Alnupo Romero, uh, which uh, it's part of civil society uh, centers in Cuba, and, and they have um, released a campaign against uh, gender-based violence and machismo. And they are doing that in a, in, in a more community way, but also uh, advertising big posters uh, throughout the city and trying to partner with, partner with the Cuban television to try to push for these messages. So um, this debate is not only taking place in social places, social media, there are other channels. Um, but yeah, I do believe that uh, it's, um, yeah, those who can afford it are the ones who are more actively engaged with that, but not, on, not the only ones. Um, one, yeah, one quick uh, add to what Teresa said, I, I agree. And, uh, and I think it's important to emphasize that we are talking about a very specific sector of the population in, in very specific areas of Cuba. Again, by no means this is talking about uh, the whole island we know that internet access is very, very expensive for, for most Cubans. And, and even those who have, some of, of those who have access don't even know how to use it there. So it is, it, it is creating inequalities as well. Having high prices and, 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 having, and having internet as a way of organizing is of course creating and will continue to create inequalities even when, when, we, when we see uh, um, lower prices for internet, for example. And there is actually a campaign also in social media to, to lower the prices of, of internet access for Cubans. But it's not only that, but also other prices that are going up. So this is something that uh, I think it should be observed closely and see how the evolution of this group and, and this in these very specific areas is going to develop in the future. Okay, um, it takes a bit to unmute. <laughs> we have a very interesting questions for from your Danca Castilla. Um, and basically it relates to the commentaries regarding local development projects. Uh, since there is a legal framework that supports such local development projects, uh, beginning with the Cuban constitutions, these projects can be funding, funded by international collaboration funds, government enterprise funds, and funds from entrepreneurs. The advantage of this is that the level of authorization is in the local government, which makes the process less complicated. Would either one of you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think that... Um even though, I mean, I, I, I agree with the comment and I do believe that even though there is a, a very general framework for, for how this kind of collaboration and cooperation can be done, it is true that it, it, it depends a lot on who's the bureaucrat behind that approval and how uh, and, and if they decide to promote that partnership or not. I think that uh, it's still very uh, difficult for some of these projects and associations to get funding, for instance, from international organizations, which are not that many based in Cuba, by the way, because it's a very hard environment to work on. And I think the very the, the most positive examples that we have, like Velo Cuba and Havisi or uh, Proyecto Arte Corte and others, we have been, been able to partner with the governments are in Old Havana because of the nature of Old Havana and frankly because Eusebio Leal had that prerogative and gave them a lot of space and capacity and the resources to be able to transform that part of the city but in general uh, I think it's uh, I think it's challenging how things are moving and with the process of decentralization in Cuba, uh, the idea, at least the idea, it's to try to give the local governments more, um, more power basically to control the resources. 
And we know that in some communities and in some municipalities in, in Havana, but also outside of the outside of Havana, there are interesting partnerships that are that are increasing. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you that it's uh, it's up to the local government to promote these partnerships and to also have the resources and power to stimulate and to and to authorize some of these projects. Uh, but I think. It's one of the ways uh, of moving forward. Uh, I mean, if, if, if you think about the resources of the state, there are not that many. There are so many challenges and scarcities. And one of the bright spots could be these kind of collaborations and partnerships, um, which we have, we have seen very successful examples of this. Marie Jose, do you want to add anything? No. Okay. We have an interesting question from Phil Brenner. Uh, he's asking if you can tell um, the listeners more about the role of various church groups in the expanding civil society. I can take a first crack at it, I'm interested. Um, that's a great question, actually, and something that um, we, we do mention in our research, especially when talking about um, LGBTQI activists and, and what's been happening lately. And uh, for some context, uh, as you, many of you probably know, there's been a, an increase of, of right groups and evangelical church groups in Latin America opposing uh, progressive policies. Uh, and, and, and we have seen that in Peru and Ecuador and other, and other countries. And the same is happening in Cuba, especially coming from the evangelical church, which has created through some economic incentives and religious incentive groups that have opposed, for example, in Cuba, the introduction in the constitution of marriage equality as an article of the constitution. And it was one of the, the, the main groups organizing against, against that, um, that article of the constitution. And it's, it's also a sector of the Catholic church. And, and it's a movement throughout Latin America and the Caribbean that we're seeing a lot of organization from the evangelical church. Um, for, for, for what happened in Cuba, there was also a lot of support from the evangelical church in the United States, especially in Miami as well. And on the other hand, there are other churches, a, a sector of the Catholic church that, that is, it's approving or uh, getting involved in other, in other projects that are more progressive and, and that are aligned with the civil society groups that we have been seeing. There have been groups, uh, churches that, um, that have participated in relief efforts for hurricanes and tornadoes and, and other initiatives. But th this is an actual, uh, an actual problem for the LGBTQI movement in Cuba today and for the future of marriage equality in Cuba. And it's the amount of economic resources and power that the evangelical church is gaining today and mobilizing through, through very a lot of networks. And this is, this is a, a curious case because they have a lot of community access and they're not only uh, um, uh, reaching out to, to a specific community in Havana, but also to other neighborhoods and other provinces throughout the island. Just to just to add very briefly to that to that uh, answer is um, the the problem one of the one of the issues with the churches is that they are occupying a, a more prominent space within society also because they offer that space for for community but also for resources they provide food they provide clothes they provide. Um, not only material resources, which are very scarce today in civil society, and it definitely stimulates people to go, but also a sense of community in a very critical time uh, in society. So uh, I do believe that throughout like churches, they have been expanding some, some of their thoughts um, and, and specific ideas that Maria was promoting, uh, but also evangelical churches in Cuba has been increasing with money from the US government uh, and linked to evangelical churches in the US. Uh, and then we have seen, particularly in Latin America, the impact that they have had, in, well, in Latin America and in the U.S., the impact that they have had in elections, like in the elections of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, or the election of Donald Trump in, in, in the U.S. So we do know that they are interconnected and there's money related. Um, and I think that's something that we should also be monitoring and following because uh, they are playing a very relevant role in the society right now. Thank you very much. Um, 
we have some more questions here. And uh, we have one from Natalia Delgado, in which she states that you mentioned the citizen group who appealed to the National Assembly for legislation prohibiting violence against women. What other instances, if any, have there been of organized groups presenting petitions for legal changes to the legislation, to the legislature, basically the National Assembly? Uh, Either I one of you. I can start. Um, I mean, to my knowledge, uh, and I'm not that old or experienced in this issue, but uh, the other uh, the other initiative was uh, Proyecto Varela, uh, which started in 1998 by um, one of the opposition leaders, Osvaldo Paya, um, and that's the other project of a specific legislative initiative that it was. Um, it was quite famous because it gathered more than 1,000 signatures, which is uh, technically the amount of signatures that you need to promote uh, a citizen um, engagement and exchange to the to the Cuban Constitution or other laws. Um, but that was related to a specific group of the opposition, and it brought a lot of international attention. Um, I, I believe that because of that as well. However, from this uh, gray space, which it's our area of study, let's say, uh, this group uh, of 40 women who were able to present this specific proposal at the National Assembly at its highest level, which could have a meeting with uh, the representative of the committees of uh, gender rights at the National Assembly. It is the first time that it's, uh, it, it, it happens, to my knowledge, and that's why we think it's also very relevant. Uh, we um, have been in conversation with some of them, and I think it's a very interesting uh, proposal um, and a um, legislative tool that has not been explored maybe by other groups, uh, but there are some uh, other groups uh, related to LGBT, and I think particularly around the discussion that is going to take place around the family code and the same-sex marriage, uh, that they are trying to do other things. The difference is that it's not at the constitutional level at the National Assembly, it's going to be at the family code, uh, but they are trying to advocate as well at different levels. Uh, okay. I don't know if Maria would like to add, or Meg? Well, Maria? You go ahead, Meg. Well, um, there are the Asociación Nacional de Agricultores Pequeños have uh, always had a uh, strong sense of identity within the National Assembly. And so ANAP has at times pressured for uh, certain legislation that would benefit small farmers uh, and medium-sized farmers and they have been in the past, and this goes back a ways um, before the recent era, um, somewhat successful in getting a, uh, responses um, from the National Assembly as well as from the government. So ANAP more or less was a pioneer in this field of um, pressuring the government for more benefits. Marie, do you wanna add anything? No, thanks. No. Okay, uh, we have a question from Signe Meyer. Have these initiatives begun to spread and encourage greater activism in other areas of the Caribbean and Latin America? If not, do you expect the increasing access to the internet in Cuba and elsewhere and the successes or lack of repression of these movements of civil society to encourage those elsewhere, and special, especially in more travel-friendly post COVID world? I can. So, shot. <laughs> so, uh, I think there, there's been, um, there's been communication and, and encouragement between, between activist groups in Latin America and the Caribbean, and it's happening uh, in some cases, and in the cases that we're looking at, uh, at a sometimes at a small level in others at a bigger level. And for example, for the LGBTQI movement, which uh, it's becoming more of a grassroots movement, there, there's been a lot of exchanges with other partners in Latin America and the Caribbean in the United States as well. 
And I, and I think even for the government institution that it's working toward, toward those changes, which is the Center for, for the, the National Center for, for Sexual Education, CNSX, they do have a, a lot of exchanges, but also for independent activist groups and civil society groups. Um, I don't think, um, I think this is, a, this is only beginning. And if we see a, a, a bigger growth of, of civil society group of activists and, and, and more engagement, we're gonna see more of this influence and it will be, and, and, and it, all, it also depends on the level of association permitting and all their legal avenues. If, if you don't have a legal avenue, there, there, are many, um, there are many mechanisms that are close to you in terms of participating in, in regional events or, or you know, enrolling in curses or, or changes. So it, it, is, it is depending not only on the growth of, of this activism, but also on how the, the, the legal side will evolve. And then as I mentioned before, I think there, there's been the same kind of influence on the, um, the the side that it's proposing um, uh, right right wing policies that are proposing uh, going backwards in some of the gains of, of some of these groups as the evangelical church and I do see see as and Teresa mentioned this that there is uh, there is a lot of communication there is a lot of exchange and there are more resources within those groups with with groups in Latin America and the Caribbean I've heard that from activists in again in Peru in Ecuador in Chile. Um, there, there is a lot of, of increasing access to, to groups in Cuba and, and vice versa. Yes, with, with more internet and with more travel, this is, this is going to, to encourage those elsewhere and, and, and also those in Cuba. I do believe it's relevant, it's very relevant for, for these groups to, to exchange, to have communication, to, to collaborate, especially for, for these incipient groups in Cuba that, are, that don't have the, the historical experience that all their movements and civil rights movements have uh, throughout the world. I guess my, uh, my two cents on this, and I, I agree with Maria, I think, um, Specifically for the, these uh, recent developments in civil society participation, there has been much more influence of Latin American countries over these Cuban groups than the other way around, um, particularly around gender justice, for instance, and the Me Too movement and the movement Ni Una Menos, uh, which spread throughout Latin America. We can see how the influence and networks and working partnerships and relationships that some of these women have had with women throughout Latin America has promoted and encouraged some of these uh, specific initiatives. Um, and that's a very concrete example. At the same time, uh, there are so many gains and sex stories about also in Cuban society, which don't, are not necessarily promoted by civil society. They were uh, part of, uh, of, of the revolution in Cuba. And I think others could learn a lot as well from, from, from some of these experiences in Cuba. Uh, for instance, uh, around reproductive uh, rights and justice, which is one of the things that uh, the Cuban government was uh, one of the pioneers and also, um, and I think it's, it's a gain and something that should be stand for. Uh, and I would like to see more of those links uh, around this activism and advocacy around those rights linked to, to places in Latin America. So in general, I would, I, I, would, I would like to say that, yes, I would like to see Cuban civil society group much more linked and related to the Latin American partners. Um, I think that sometimes these partnerships can seem um, a little bit from, with skepticism and distrust from the government because sometimes there has been money from the US government involved in this kind of projects, uh, particularly for the democracy, democracy promotion programs, which obviously have a subversive uh, role in Cuban society. So putting that aside, uh, which I think it's the wrong, wrong way and wrong, wrong partnership and the wrong way of channeling that money uh, and they shouldn't accept, I do believe that there's important to build those kind of partnerships more and more and more with, with, with Latin America and also Central America and the Caribbean. Sometimes uh, we are so close regionally I mean, Cuba from, from, from that area and, and the connections and the, and the working relationship are not that strong as with other countries or, or, we are, or Cubans are 
and we say Cubans, and me part of them, we're also looking at the US is sometimes instead of looking at the South and how those South to South learning experiences and collaboration could be developed. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, we have a question about whether the right of association was widely discussed prior to the enactment of the last constitution and was it included or excluded? I can start. Uh, the right of association, it's uh, recognized at the constitutional level in Cuba. However, uh, there was not that much debate about the right of association and the right uh, of freedom of expression in the, in the in the last debate around the constitution and the referendum. I think um, there were key issues like the new structure of the political system in Cuba, uh, which was more prominent in those debates, but also the uh, sex and marriage and LGBT rights um, also capture a lot of a lot of that debate. Um, but we, as we mentioned before, there are a huge number of around 80 different pieces of legislation, laws, decrees, regulations, and other things that has to be legislated and has to be enacted and implemented uh, that we hope to see a new law of association among all of the new ones that they have to do. Of course, um, the legislative calendar, it's delayed right now because of COVID issues, but there is a legislative calendar and some of those uh, laws are going to come in the next uh, few months and couple of years, I would say. Um, we have a comment from Norman for internet, while still high, has been gradually coming down over the 10 or so years since the service began. Earlier this year, the cost for ETSESA of one hour of internet Wi-Fi card was reduced from one kook to 0 0.70 kooks. Originally, it was an outrageous eight kooks. Also, Cuban residents can now have Wi-Fi in their homes, and there too, the price for them is high, but gradually being reduced. Do you have any comments on Norman's comment? I guess not. <laughs> um, I can, uh, my only comment is uh, it, that is yeah, right. There, there's been a, a, a diminishing of the price of internet. However, we, when you look at the big picture, there has been an increase in other prices and, and um, there hasn't been an increase in salaries, so they're, they're uh, discussing this possibility. So even though the price has been reducing, it's still high compared to the, to the uh, monthly salar salary of, of a Cuban working for the state sector. And, and also uh, in terms of Wi-Fi access, it's a very limited option still. Uh, it it, it uh, requires a lot of bureaucracy as well. So this is gradually changing, but it, the, the fact that the prices are reducing doesn't mean that it, it's more available for everyone in Cuba. And uh, it will depend on other factors, economic factors um, as well, as well as the organization having only one company providing internet services is limiting the, the supply. And, and for example, installing Wi-Fi at your home takes time, uh, you have to be on a waiting list, and, and it's a whole process. So I think one of the factors that it's influencing uh, how people are accessing to internet is not only price, but also um, having just one state company as a monopoly over internet. Okay, I will move on to a question from B. Freeman. Have you seen much impact of the Black Lives Matter movement in Cuba? Um, I can start and yes, there, there are many, many groups in Cuba who have been inspired for many, many years on, on, on not only the Black Slide Matter, but other, uh, uh, other groups here in the U.S. by the, the civil rights movement, by, by other movements in the 80s. And yes, there, there's, been, there, there's been an impact. There's, there's been a lot of reflection, internal reflection about what's happening in Cuba in terms of fighting racism both from an institutional perspective, but also coming from cultural and, and, and um, cultural traditions. And, and uh, we have seen protests over police violence in Cuba and also 
Uh, we have seen repression from the Cuban government to this protest against poli police violence in Cuba. So yes, there, there is uh, without doubt an influence of the Blacks, uh, Black Lives Matter movement in Cuba. Okay. Yes, uh, yeah, just to add a little bit, uh, mm, expanding beyond the Black Lives Matter and the issues around race and racial discrimination in Cuba. Um, and the Cuban kind of Afro-descendant movement has expanded since its emergence in the 1990s. Uh, it is not particularly new or from more recent times. Um, however, I think that, that nowadays the movement is much more complex and intersectional and diverse than it was 20 years ago. And it also encompasses uh, a wide variety of issues and expressions, including community initiatives and cultural and artistic projects, among others. Um, there are different groups um, and it's not worth mentioning all but they are uh, very activists in the work that they do but they have also been pushing for these issues to gain a prominence in the Cuban debate uh, because for many years uh, the Cuban government uh, has long held the elimination elimination and quote unquote of uh, racial segregation uh, or racism as one of the revolution's greatest achievement however uh, there has been limited steps to address remaining structural racial inequalities and discrimination and is one of the questions that um, now with the expansion of the private sector people are asking which are the labor rights and protections that people have based against discrimination in the private sector um, and recently uh, in November 2018 the Cuban government launched uh, this new national program against racism and racial discrimination, uh, which I think the creation of the program it's in itself, it's an important step and a recognition that we do have a problem. Uh, and activists welcome the move, although many have raised um, issues around in its implementation and the participation of independent groups and how activists are going to provide feedback into this new mechanism. And lately I haven't heard a lot about the development of this national program, but I do believe that it's another example of the recognition that we do have a problem. Activists are calling for it and raising awareness and we have to do something about it. How it's done, I think it's a, it's a different question. And that's where we have to listen to those, the experts on the issues, people who have been working on this issue for years to try to get their feedback and work in alliance with them. One more thing there, I think, uh, in, in that specific case, um, there there isn't a lot of communication with with uh, uh, these groups that are uh, promoting um, Afro-Cuban culture and history um, that are that are fighting racism from the community. Uh, as Teresa mentioned, they have been working for many years, more than thirty years, and they have they haven't had the the uh, the uh, attention from the media, for example, they haven't had, uh, and, and, and there is one real concern from, from coming from these groups and these communities, and it's that uh, the expansion of tourism, the expansion of the non-state sector, where did it happen? Who were the owners? Mainly white Cubans, uh, mainly men, and we're seeing a lot of inequalities as, as they relate to, to, to women and, and black women in Cuba. So there are many of these issues that are still that remain under the carpet. And even though there is a policy from the Cuban government to uh, um, in some way uh, combat racism and institutional racism, there has to be a different conversation with these groups that have been on the ground working for many years on several issues, including cultural exchanges, including community projects with children, uh, uh, and, and these groups specifically are not only in Havana. You see a lot of these groups only uh, also in Santiago de Cuba and other provinces. So um, this is a big issue right now. And, and my perception and it, it is that it's very hard uh, for, for, for the average Cuban to understand that there is racism in Cuba and that we have to fight it from the family level to institutional level. Um, so I do believe there should be more communication in, in, in this sense with, the, with these activist groups and others. Thank you, Marie-Jose. Marie -Jose. We have two questions from Yanis. 
is the civil society in Cuba sprouting naturally from within Cuban society, or is it a foreign species fed by outside institutions or entities? And her second question is, what's the difference of right of association and freedom of association? I will start with the last one since it's an easy one. Technically, and I know we have used the terms like both terms, but technically it's the right to freedom of association. So it's the same thing, uh, but uh, it's a very legal, I guess, uh, kind of question. So it's the same. It's a right to freedom of association. And in terms of the, of the other question, I don't think there's a simple answer. Uh, I think there's a mix of everything, and that's exactly why we started trying to address in, uh, trying to address the internal and external factors that have influenced this kind of new, vibrant, more engaged civil society in Cuba. Um, I won't go again through the factors, but I do believe that the process of socioeconomic reforms, uh, as it happened in the 90s, there was an opening. And then after the 2008, 2008 2010, with uh, the guidelines and the process of reform, it opened spaces, of course. But it was also part of Cuba's um, kind of uh, new way of interacting with the rest of the world and new opening. And Maria make reference specifically uh, to the new relationship with the US government, but it also has to do with its new vision towards Latin America, uh, but also the new conversation not new now, new at that time, around that time, with the European Union uh, and the dialogues around human rights issues, for instance, that mark a new relationship, I think, uh, with Cuba and its foreign policy. And I believe that in general, um, in Cuba, there has been an, an, a connection with the rest of the world in, in many ways. And at the beginning, uh, the first decades of the revolution, it was more about solidarity and internationalism and, and the different missions uh, from outside. But I also think that, yeah, it's, it's a mix of uh, internal and external factors and interconnected with the world. And I think uh, there nobody can escape uh, the changes uh, of, of technologies and the impact that that has happened in our society. I think, uh, as we have mentioned many times, uh, the internet expansion has uh, played a, a huge role. But at the same time, Cuban society was ready for that. It's been a long overdue change uh, that uh, people needed. And Cuban society were very well educated, although there are challenges and issues that we will know. But we were able to use those tools and to explore them. And, um, and then there were other more kind of innovative, creative, the Cuban way of doing things like the package, for instance, that uh, the Cuban paquete, that package of media, including movies and newspapers and uh, all kind of products where we didn't have access to internet that was circulating and still is because it's way cheaper uh, to pass information with pen drives and hard drives. So we have always been connected to with, with, with the, rest, the rest of the world. And I think it's just an evolution of um, a normal evolution of how things, of things were going. Um, I don't know if that responds to the question. Uh, and if Maria would like to add something since she was the one who explored that part. No, you did a great summary. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you don't want to add anything, Marie Jose? No, I'm good. No. Then we will wrap up with the question that was addressed to myself. And that was why in the Cuba and Beyond series, uh, there is not a session on the Cuban healthcare system's approach to covid and the U.S. And uh, the response to that is that um, the Institute for Latin American Studies has a website uh, which has provided materials, including um, some uh, podcasts concerning this. Um, in addition, Medic, uh, the publication which covers medical care and public health issues in Cuba and is published jointly by medical professionals in Cuba and in the United States, uh, has been covering it closely, as have another, uh, other general in interest publications 
uh, for example, Progresso, uh, Toque, uh, et cetera. Um, the Washington office on Latin America has also uh, been covering responses to the pandemic. The Woodrow Wilson uh, Center for International Studies in Washington, D.C., as well as the Inter-American Dialogue have both have sessions as well as reports on it. And um, you will remember that both Marie Jose and Teresa referred to some of the responses in this uh, session. And in the other sessions, for example, the education session in November, uh, they will, the speakers will be uh, comparing the U.S. responses in terms of schools uh, with the Cuban responses. So rather than have a separate session, we've tried to encourage the speakers to address it. But we've also, particularly the Institute of Latin American Studies, to which we belong, has a major uh, website on the issue uh, for all of Latin America. I now want to thank the audience for an extremely rich series of questions to which our uh, speakers, Marie Jose Espinosa and Teresa Garcia Castro, have responded absolutely exceptionally. And um, I'm delighted uh, that we had the opportunity to provide a platform for both of you and to present your work on civil society. And a final thanks to um, the person who has rescued us any number of times, namely Gretchen Sanchez Higueras, and occasionally Harold Cardenas. So thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you again on September 26th, 22nd, when the topic will be political trends within the Latino community in the U.S. in view of the presidential elections in November. So please come back for that one. And goodbye and stay safe.